Hello and welcome to my first lecture on hallucinogens. This will be a two-part series. Uh, in this lecture I'm going to focus almost exclusively on LSD. But before we get there, a few basic definitions. What do we mean when we talk about hallucinogens? What are the drugs we're referring to? What makes them similar to one another and different from other drugs? Well, they're a diverse group of drugs and we sometimes hear an older term thrown around when we talk about hallucinogens. Um, that's the word psychedelic. Psychedelic meaning mind expanding, a kind of a positive connotation for uh, the idea of drugs changing or enhancing the way the mind works. Um, we sometimes hear the, the term hallucinogen, suggesting that these are hallucinogen or hallucination producing drugs. Um, it's in a way a bad definition or a bad name because we don't always see hallucinations uh, from drugs in this group. Uh, hallucinations mean meaning perceiving things that uh, to be there which are not there, you know, seeing something in your presence which isn't there, hearing a sound which uh, is not coming from anything in your environment. Those would be, be hallucinations and what we see more commonly with the hallucinogenic drugs are rather distortions in perception. If you take LSD, you don't necessarily see something that doesn't exist, rather you see the things that do exist around you in a somewhat different, somewhat distorted way. And it's worth noting that many drugs cause distortions in perception, especially at high doses. So um, if you've ever uh, you know, taken a lot of or smoked a lot of marijuana or if you've drunk a lot of alcohol or even uh, under some circumstances if you've had an awful lot of caffeine, you can have distortions in the way you're perceiving the world around you. Um, the difference there is that those distortions occur at relatively high doses of those different drugs. With hallucinogens, we see distortions in perception at relatively low doses. Drugs like LSD are tremendously potent from the perspective that very small doses of the uh, active chemical, very you know, micrograms of LSD, will give you very pronounced distortions in the way you perceive the world around you. So basic definitions, words like psychedelic, hallucin uh, hallucinogen, are used somewhat interchangeably. In a way they're not great definitions because they sort of, or they're not great names because they kind of take us a little bit away from the reality of how these drugs work, but they're, they're what we typically use. So now let's move on and talk about some of the different groups or classifications that we can apply to hallucinogens. Well, one group of hallucinogens we sometimes call the serotonergic hallucinogens because they seem to be active on serotonin systems in the brain. This includes LSD, psilocybin, which is a compound present in some uh, psychedelic mushrooms, and mescaline, which is a compound that is uh, present in a particular form of cactus. And all of these work in fairly similar ways on the, on the serotonin systems in different parts of your brain. And they're so similar, in fact, that you can develop interesting cross tolerance for two or more of these drugs. You know, so for instance, if you use LSD regularly and then you're given psilocybin, you'll be quite tolerant to psilocybin even if you've never used it before, or vice versa, because they work on these common uh, chemical pathways in the brain. Another group of, uh, of hallucinogens that we sometimes talk about are the methylated amphetamines. Um, most famous uh, in this group is MDMA or ecstasy or sometimes molly. There are other uh, chemical compounds which are pretty similar like MDA. Um, as you could guess from the name, these are actually kind of uh, tweaked versions of amphetamines. Uh, so much, and they're so similar that sometimes, at least in some uh, pharmacology textbooks, MDMA will be grouped in with the stimulants, along with you know, um, you know, uh, dextroamphetamine and methamphetamine and drugs which we've already talked about. In other textbooks, and indeed, obviously, in this lecture, I'm uh, we're pulling those out and we're talking about them along with the hallucinogens because they do produce some distortions in perception that are similar to those we observe with other hallucinogens. Now these drugs are interesting because they act on monoamine systems including serotonin but also including norepinephrine and dopamine. So they work somewhat differently although there are some common uh, pathways uh, that they share with the serotonergic hallucin uh, hallucinogens. There's a whole group of um, uh, hallucinogens which act upon the acetylcholine systems in the brain. These are the acetylcholine, uh, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, the anticholinergic hallucinogens. Uh, atropine is an example of those. Um, 
there are uh, hallucinogens which are chemically unlike neurotransmitters, ones that we, in a sense, don't really know as much about. We're not exactly sure uh, why they work the way they do. So ketamine is an example of this that maybe, uh, you know, it seems to influence the glutamate systems of your brain, although it does so um, not because it chemically resembles any uh, neurotransmitters, including glutamate. And there's even a relatively new hallucinogen that's been um, been observed and studied in recent years. Um, not really new in, in so much as it's a plant which has been around for millennia, but the plant uh, Salvia divinorum, uh, which uh, you can certainly find plenty of videos on YouTube of people using uh, Salvia divinorum, uh, you know, chewing it or smoking it. It's a uh, plant which will produce relatively short hallucinations or distortions in perception, and it seems to do so by acting on a group of opiate receptors in the different opiate systems within your brain. So bottom line is there are different groups of hallucinogens. As you can see, they're grouped primarily because of what we know or what we think we know about the uh, chemical mechanism by which they uh, influence the nervous system. So with those preliminaries out of the way, let's move on and look at an overview for this lecture. As I often do, I'm going to start with a little bit of history. I'm going to focus on LSD, so it'll be the history of LSD. I'm going to talk a little bit about current use of LSD. Talk a little bit about the pharmacology of LSD. And then move on to talk about the acute effects uh, in the central and peripheral nervous system. And I'll address some facts and fiction, some kind of myths and misconceptions about LSD. All right, so the history of LSD. Like the history of some of the other drugs we've talked about, it begins with a natural uh, substance, not a plant this time, but rather a fungus. The fungi is called ergot. Ergot grows on a variety of grains um, naturally. It, it, will, it will grow, especially if those grains are raised in a kind of damp or stored in damp conditions. And the fungi, ergot, uh, has a number of different alkaloids in it, including one which is LSD. And we know a little bit about this from historical records of ergot poisoning, which would occur or have occurred throughout history uh, in situations where people uh, would farm in a region and then store, dry and store their grain in, you know, like a silo or, um, you know, a storage area that ended up getting a little bit too damp. And because of that dampness, ergot would grow and then the people unknowingly would consume the grain by baking it into bread and then eating it and then suffer a variety of really unpleasant symptoms, including pain, convulsions, decreased blood flow to the extremities of the body, and even hallucinations. So um, there are actually historical accounts of this happening in different parts of Europe where the climate is often kind of cold and a bit damp. Um, these uh, accounts often uh, use the phrase St. Anthony's fire um, to refer to these kind of mass hallucinations where like a whole town of people would all of a sudden all start to hallucinate at about the same time. Um, at different points in history these hallucinations often had a kind of a religious feel to them where people would be uh, a fear being visited by you know demons or visited by angels and surely quite terrifying experience to have. Um, but it was because we think, at least when we look at these historical records, we think it's probably just mass ergot poisoning for all the people who lived in that region of the, of the town. So again, uh, ergot has existed, of course, for millennia. Um, it's probably caused hallucinations, at least from time to time in people. It's not the case that people, at least as far as we know, sought out ergot or understood that they could take it to, con to have hallucinations. Um, so it was only much, much later in history that humans really began to understand how the compounds in ergot produced the hallucinations that they produce. So if we skip ahead a little bit further in history, all the way up to the 1930s, we meet Albert Hoffman, who's a Swiss chemist who was working with um, different compounds that could be extracted from the ergot fungus uh, because he was looking to try and develop a, um, a respiratory and circulatory stimulant that could be useful for medical purposes. He was working at the time for, I think it was the Sandoz Pharmaceutical Company, and he accidentally um, isolated uh, LS uh, lysergic acid dimethylide, LSD, uh, from ergot and dosed himself on it without really meaning to and experienced a really profound hallucination. 
So uh, being the good scientist that he was, um, you know, after accidentally dosing himself on LSD once, he later went back and deliberately dosed himself again and found that he could get these really strong hallucinogenic or kind of perception distorting effects from very, very small doses of this apparently incredibly strong uh, drug. Now, it wasn't really clear, at least initially, what could be done with this drug because it didn't have the medical um, effects that were uh, initially desired. It wasn't a very powerful respiratory or circulatory stimulant, but it did have these weird side effects. Um, and one area of interest that, that, or one possibility for the use of this drug turns out to be its use in psychotherapy. Now, at the time, uh, a lot of psychotherapy, whether practiced by psychiatrists or by psychoanalysts uh, or psychologists, was, uh, was based on notions of the mind that came from Sigmund Freud and his, his kind of theories of how the mind works. And uh, those theories, as you may know from your intro psych class, have, have a lot to do with uncovering unconscious motivations or drives, hidden lusts and fears that you have kind of lurking in the back of your mind. And um, these, uh, these unconscious drives are uncovered through lengthy uh, psychoanalytic sessions where you free associate or you analyze your dreams to kind of uncover what's hidden within your mind. Um, some people at the time thought that maybe LSD would be a kind of a, a quicker way to get at that unconscious material because it seemed to somehow open up the, uh, the doors of the mind, if you will. Um, one of these people was a man named Humphrey Osmond. He was a British psychiatrist who started using LSD in psychotherapy and also uh, was a friend and a colleague of Aldous Huxley, the writer, who took um, different drugs with Osmond, including LSD, but also other psychedelic drugs like mescaline and psilocybin. Now you may be familiar with Aldous Huxley if you've ever read, maybe in high school, the book The Doors of Perception, um, or if you just like classic rock and you've listened to the band The Doors, who based their name on the title of this book. Uh, the Doors of Perception was actually inspired by an experience with mescaline, and not LSD, although mescaline and LSD are both serotonergic hallucinogens, an experience that Huxley had. And it's interesting because it talks about these kind of uh, deeply religious themes uh, that can occur when the, mind, uh, when the mind has been properly opened, when the doors of perception are cast wide. Um, the book was very uh, was a, a, a bestseller. It was kind of an influential book, and it kind of brought to the broader culture and broader population this idea of using psychedelic drugs or hallucinogenic drugs to open up the mind. At about the same time in history, although with a lot less. Um, a lot with a lot more secrecy, the CIA was conducting a series of strange experiments under the name MK Ultra, where they were looking to see whether LSD or other hallucinogenic drugs could be useful for interrogation purposes. Um, at the time, there's a lot of fear that uh, the Soviet Union was developing techniques to control the minds of soldiers or control the minds of politicians. There was this fe feeling that um, we needed to be able to counteract these potential mind control effects that supposedly the Soviets were working on. And LSD and other hallucinogens seem to provide this uh, possibility, uh, a possible way to counteract these effects. If you captured an enemy soldier and wanted him to divulge secrets, you could give him LSD and it would sort of open up his mind and you'd be able to really easily extract information from it. Uh, the MK Ultra project was a real disaster, um, both in terms of not producing any useful results. LSD is not a very good drug uh, for using in interrogations. It was also incredibly unethical. Um, if you want to read a really interesting history, uh, well, of the CIA, which has very interesting history around it, uh, look up the MK Ultra studies. Um, it'll, it's disturbing. It's interesting. Um, it's worth paying a little bit of attention to. I'll see if I can find some YouTube clips that talk about the history, and if I can, I'll link them uh, to the Blackboard website. Moving a little bit forward in time, we enter the sort of psychedelic era, and an American psychologist, Timothy Leary, began doing his own studies with LSD, and beyond his own academic research, became this kind of cultural figure who popularized the use of LSD to the broader uh, kind of population or broader culture. 
during the 1960s. He was, he was kind of an icon of the, of the counterculture, of the movement of mostly young people who were rejecting the values and the sort of standards and mores of the dominant society. Um, uh, Leary's you know, famous quote was that people need to tune in, turn on, and drop out of society. And a lot of times that process, he thought, involved using psychedelic drugs. So during the 1960s, there was this really interesting time when LSD was was um, you know legal to use. It was being used by different people in different parts of society, um, and it had a kind of an impact. It was influenced art, it influenced um, music and kind of culture. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later on. But there were also concerns that maybe this could be uh, this drug could be dangerous, or that the effect of having a lot of people on this drug for society might not be uh, so good. So kind of like we normally see with drugs, there's a period of time during which uh, the, you know, a new drug appears and people get very interested in it and kind of an enthusiasm for it grows. And then shortly thereafter, there's kind of a, a, a period of fear or uncertainty about that same drug uh, that follows. And during the 1950s and 1960s, there was a lot, of, there were a lot of those feelings about LSD. Um, during the 1960s, the, you know, the counterculture um, of folks who were war, pro war protesters or civil rights protesters or just generally people who opposed authority um, were apt to be open to the use of drugs. It's not the case that all of the people involved in, in protest movements were drug users or even LSD users, but there is kind of an overlap between the drug using population and uh, people who are in one way or the other questioning the values and the laws and the government of the broader society. And concern over these people, and concern over the uh, upset and kind of social upheaval of the 1960s was part of the movement or part of the push behind the Comprehensive Drug Control and Regulation Act that I've talked about quite a few times before. Um, as you know, of course, from previous lectures, this is the piece of federal, federal legislation that sets up a series of categories for different drugs. Those categories dictate to a large extent how legal or illegal a drug is, how easy it is to access, how dangerous or difficult it is to access. LSD was put on Schedule 1 uh, because it was a drug that was thought to have no uh, medical uses, high potential for abuse and be fairly dangerous for folks. Um, in a way, of course, that's strange because there were, or at least there is some sense that there might be medical uses for the drug. And there doesn't seem to be, as we'll discuss a little bit later on, a great deal of potential for abuse of LSD. But nonetheless, it was made a very illegal drug, in part because of concerns that the government had over um, the fact that there were protesters out in the world who were using drugs and kind of questioning the values of society. Anyway, what happened after that? Let's look at some more recent trends in LSD's history. Now, during the 1960s and into the 70s, there's increasing uh, use of LSD. You know, gr greater and greater fractions of the society were using the drug. You know, from as low as about one percent in the late 1960s to up to 18 percent or so in 1971 of college students were saying that they'd ever used LSD. That trend tended to decrease. Uh, in the 1970s and into the 1980s, kind of as we've seen before with a lot of other drugs. Then during the 1990s, there's this kind of rebound as drugs in general became more popular. Certainly, uh, there was a kind of an overlap between the popularity of LSD and other psychedelics and the rise in popularity of electronic dance music. Um, you know, in part because uh, people who, uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit in the future lecture when I talk about MDMA, um, you could go to, I mean, I remember this back in the 1990s, you could go to outdoor music festivals or kind of indoor uh, electronic raves and listen to techno music all night and take LSD or other drugs. Not that I did that, but that certainly happened. I have plenty of friends who did. Uh, so there's kind of a surge in popularity of LSD during the 1990s. And then in the 2000s, uh, kind of the lifetime use of LSD tailed off a little bit and began to decline. So in a sense, the, uh, the little magic bus drove away into the distance during the 2000s. All of that gives us a little bit of a preview for what we know about the current use of LSD. So as we always do, we'll start with the monitoring the future data set. And here, if we're looking at high school uh, students, 
and we're asking, have you used LSD in the last uh, 12 months? You know, what's the one year prevalence of use? You can see the rates kind of fell during the 1970s somewhat. They rose during the 1990s and then fell again in the 2000s. Um, as did the perceived availability. In general, this is a drug that isn't very commonly used, at least among young people, meaning high school people, and it's not uh, seen as fairly, uh, all that available uh, to them either. It's fairly low perceived availability. Again, for many drugs, monitoring the future asks about perceived risk and disapproval for using. And here, if we ask for LSD, we see that there's kind of a I don't know if you call this a moderate level of risk associated with using the drug and a fairly high level of disapproval. So the drug isn't tremendously popular among young people, at least not based on what they're telling us, and uh, it's seen as something that people ought not to be doing, uh, which is interesting because again, in, in the past, kind of in the 70s, those numbers were different and there, there were higher levels of use and probably lower levels of disapproval. If we look out into the broader population with the National Survey of Drug Use and Health and just ask like among all people over the age of 12, um, uh, what is the lifetime percentage uh, use of hallucinogens? This includes LSD, but isn't limited to only LSD. There we see upwards of 15% or more of people will report having used LSD at least once in their lifetime. So it's a drug which is out there. Um, it's not that much used by young people. Even among people of all ages, it's um, you know, the use rates are not incredibly high, but neither are they particularly low. And those rates have, of course, as I've discussed, changed quite a bit over the last few decades. So with all that in mind, let's move on and talk a little bit about the acute effects of LSD. You know, what goes on uh, in your body, what goes on in your brain when you use LSD. Well, in the peripheral nervous system, uh, LSD acts as a sympathetic autonomic activator. So it tends to uh, show a mild uh, kind of sympathetic activation. So someone taking LSD will have increased heart rate and blood pressure, um, a little bit like what uh, Hoffman and his colleagues were trying to discover way back in the 30s. I mean, LSD does kind of stimulate the circulatory system, although not nearly so much as other drugs. So it's not a very good stimulant. Um, there are dil uh, people under LSD will have dilated pupils and kind of elevated body temperature. Again, not nearly so strong as we would see with some of the stimulant drugs. If we go into the central nervous system, um, serotonin, or I'm sorry, LSD acts by influencing the serotonin receptors, particularly a class of receptors called the serotonin 2A receptors. Um, you know, if this was a hardcore neuropsych uh, neurobiology class, we'd discuss all the different types of serotonin receptors, of which there are quite a few. Um, this is one subtype which is um, found a lot in areas of the midbrain and forebrain, especially the, the forebrain where uh, emotions are processed and sensory information is processed. So the ability of LSD to in influence those receptors in those parts of the brain may explain why it tends to distort to some extent our emotions and also distort to a much greater extent our perception. Interestingly, one of the uh, experiences that people on LSD will sometimes report is synesthesia. That's where they experience uh, information from one sensory channel in another sensory channel. So, uh, you know, they will report being able to touch colors or hear tastes or, you know, uh, see sounds. This kind of mixing over or intermingling of sensory information, which can be quite pleasant or could be unpleasant depending on the setting in which you're, you're using uh, the drug. So this is thought to have to do with the activity of the drug on uh, systems within the brain, especially within the forebrain, that use uh, serotonin and have these serotonin 2A receptors. So, okay, so that's a little bit about the acute effects of the drug. Let's look a little bit at some of the chronic effects of the drug. And here, I'm just kind of calling this area fact and fiction uh, about LSD. Um, fact and fiction about LSD. Will LSD produce dependence? Um, it's interesting to note that long-term use of LSD is fairly rare. I mean, I, I'm sure there are people out there who regularly use the drug over long periods of time in their life, but they're pretty unusual folks. Uh, we don't see uh, regular users of this drug the way we do for many of the other drugs that we've talked about. 
Um, and that's probably due to a couple reasons. One is you fairly quickly build up a tolerance for the drug. So if you were to try and take LSD every single day, um, you would probably have to take greater and greater amounts of it because your body fairly quickly adjusts to the drug. Um, another reason, and this may be more important in explaining why people don't become dependent over time, is that it's not a very easy high for folks to have. And when you take LSD, you may have a hallucinatory experience or you know, distortions in perception that can last four, eight, 12, even more hours. You know? And um, so the experience can be unpredictable. You know, some portions of it may be pleasant, you know, a good trip, as users will say. A lot of it may be very scary or disorienting or threatening, a, a, you know, a bad trip. And anytime you take LSD, it can be difficult to know whether you'll have a good trip or a bad trip. Thus, it's there may not be a lot of uh, positive reinforcement for using the drug. You know, someone might try it once and enjoy it, try it another time and find it really terrifying. Um, thus, not feeling particularly motivated to try it that third time. That seems to be what we see clinically. Um, certainly, it comports with my own experience of talking to people who've used LSD. You know, um, 201, they've all said to me things like, well, you know, it's something that I enjoyed once or twice, but I really have no strong motivation to do again. So it's just not a drug that seems to produce the kind of addictive or dependent type of use that we see with many other drugs. Fact or fiction, will LSD uh, produce uh, panic or psychosis? Does taking LSD make you crazy? Um, there's very little evidence that long-term use of LSD increases rates of mental illness, um, except among people who have pre-existing risk for the condition. Um, people who are, tend who are very anxious uh, should probably not use LSD uh, because it's likely that the uncertainty and the unpredictability of the experience will play upon their anxiety and make them feel scared or even panicked. Uh, people who have risk for schizophrenia or other psychotic disorders should probably not take LSD because it does seem to increase the chance that they'll have a psychotic episode. Um, again, it's, does the drug by itself produce these problems? Probably not. Um, can it produce those problems among people of a pre-existing liability? Perhaps. Um, LSD may be actually useful for treating uh, mental illness. There's some uh, new research that's coming out, although it's difficult to conduct research on LSD because it is still an illegal drug, uh, that suggests that it can be useful for treating some anxiety or depression conditions. So again, this idea of it producing um, or being dangerous to long-term mental health is probably not that well supported. Fact or fiction, uh, will LSD increase creativity? Um, as I mentioned before, there really was a period of time in our culture in America and also in Europe where LSD and creativity, at least in terms of kind of popular art, were intertwined. You know, back in the 60s and into the 70s, uh, many people who were artists, writers, musicians, uh, took inspiration from using LSD and other psychedelic drugs. Um, you know, famously, of course, the band The Beatles recorded Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, uh, one of their more famous albums, um, in many ways under the influence of LSD. And um, there actually was, back in, uh, back in the 50s and 60s, uh, a fair bit of research that looked at the effects of LSD on creativity. A lot of it is research which doesn't really stand up to modern standards of, um, of rigor when it comes to research, but some of it can be kind of interesting to look at. Uh, what I've included here are a series of pencil sketches that were done by an artist who was taking LSD as part of an experiment, not really an experiment, but part of a study of the relationship between uh, LSD and creativity. So um, I can see that um, uh, you know, here the text. These nine drawings are done by an artist under the influence of LSD, part of a test conducted by the U.S. government during its dalliance with uh, psychotometic drugs in the late 1950s. Um, the artist takes a dose of LSD and is given access to uh, an activity box full of crayons and pencils and other stuff. So here's his first uh, drawing done 20 minutes after his dose. 
does a second drawing um, 85 minutes after his first dose and 20 minutes after his second dose. Patient is reporting euphoria. This is consistent with kind of the early phases of LSD, um, uh, the LSD experience where the person feels kind of stimulated and may have positive feelings. He's reporting, I can see you clearly, so clearly. Um, I'm having trouble controlling my pencil. Two hours and 30 minutes after the first dose, um, you know, he's describing the outline seem normal, but very vivid. Everything is changing color. Um, my hand must follow the bold sweep of the lines. You know, the, his experience of, of um, his experience of the producing art, or at least producing the sketch, is kind of distorted and changed in a way that maybe feels exciting or, or creative for him. Um, it's interesting, his, his note here, it feels as if my consciousness is situated in the part of my body that is now active, my hand, my elbow, my tongue. Again, suggesting this way that your conscious perception of the world or, or where your mind is in perceiving the world is shifting around under the influence of LSD. Two hours and 32 minutes after the initial dose, he sort of bangs off another sketch. Um, I'm trying another drawing. The outlines of the model are normal, but now my drawing is not. The outline of my hand is, is weird too. It's not a very good drawing, is it? I'll try again. It tries very quickly to do another paint, uh, drawing. Um, I'll do this one with a flourish without stopping. One line, no break. So he does an entire drawing without picking up the pencil. Um, he starts to laugh and becomes startled by something on the floor. Two hours and 45 minutes, the patient tries to, tries to climb into the activity box and seems agitated. Um, I'm, everything's changing. They're all your face interwoven. Who is? You know, there's a sense of uh, really profound distortion in the way the person is perceiving the world. And you can imagine that some of this may be sort of unpleasant for him. It's, it's hard to know for sure. Four hours later, four, almost four and a half hours later, uh, patient retreats to the bunk, spending approximately two hours lying, waving his hands in the air. Um, you know, he's sort of taking a long time as distortions of perception are persisting. Five hours and 45 minutes after the first dose, patient continues to move about the room, intersecting with space in complex variations. Uh, it's an hour and a half before he settles down. Um, I can feel my knees again. I think it's starting to wear off. This is a pretty good drawing. The pencil is mighty hard to hold. He's holding a crayon at this time. And finally, eight hours after the first dose, the patient sits on his bunk bed. He reports that the intoxication has worn off, except for the occasional distortion of faces, what we might call a flashback experience. We ask for a final drawing, which he performs with little enthusiasm. I have nothing to say about this last drawing. It's bad and uninteresting. I want to go home now. So this isn't really, uh, it's not an experiment because it doesn't involve uh, a control group, you know, one group of people who got the drug, one group of people who didn't. It's only one person, so there's probably a lot of limitations to the type of conclusions we could draw uh, as to how LSD affects creativity in general. But I think it gives you maybe a sense of um, how LSD, in terms of distorting the way you perceive the world around you, can distort how you try to represent that world, whether artistically or linguistically. I think they also give you a sense of the unpredictability of the LSD experience and the way that, at least at times, it may be pleasant or encouraging or inspiring to the person, but at other times might be sort of threatening or disorienting. And ultimately, it's just kind of a long and somewhat difficult experience. Again, to go back to an earlier point I made in some previous slides, this may in some ways explain why for many people LSD is not something that you would choose to regularly do. It's a pretty rough ride uh, and that may you know, discourage people from becoming regular uh, heavy users of the drug. So like I said, there's a lot of this research was done back in the 50s and 60s. It is worth noting that even nowadays you find, uh, you know, famous artists and scientists, even mathematicians, who will report using LSD. You know, Steve Jobs uh, very famously talked about his own drug use, including his use of LSD, and credited LSD with inspiring his creativity. You know, like I said, there was some early research back in the 50s and 60s before the drug was uh, was illegal that had kind of mixed findings. A lot of it wasn't very strong research, at least from the moderns in in terms of the modern standards that we apply to research, uh, with some studies finding uh, evidence that LSD improved creativity, other studies finding evidence that it didn't really improve creativity. Um, 
Later research, that is research nowadays, is very limited because it's difficult to study Schedule 1 drugs. When the government makes a drug a Schedule 1 drug, it's very hard for researchers to get a hold of it legally, so it's very hard to do research on it. And it's also, to be honest, difficult to do very good measurement of creativity. It's hard to decide what constitutes creative art or creative music. So for all sorts of reasons, although there's this kind of tantalizing possibility that LSD makes you more creative or kind of opens up your mind, uh, we don't actually have a good sense of whether those claims are true, at least based on science. All we have are a lot of kind of interesting anecdotes from creative people who at different points in their lives did or uh, you know may have used LSD or other drugs. Okay, so the last point I want to make uh, or question I want to address is fact or fiction. Do users of LSD get flashbacks? Now, <clears throat> back during that series of pencil sketches that I showed you, uh, right at the end, the uh, the artist said, you know, I think the intoxication is over, except for an occasional distortion uh, of your faces, you know, the people he's talking to. Uh, that I said that experience could be described as a flashback. A flashback being more precisely called a hallucinogen persisting perceptual disorder. Just basically the idea that if you've used LSD or another hallucinogen, you may from time to time later on in your life experience distortions in perception, even though it's been a long time since you last used the drug. Um, here we have a lot of anecdotal accounts of this happening. It's very difficult to study this uh, and you know at least the last time I looked I found all sorts of different rates of, of flashbacks or hallucinogen persistent uh, perceptual disorders as low as five percent of users as high as a, a third of users reporting in some surveys experiences of flashbacks. We don't really know why people have flashbacks if they do. It doesn't seem to be the case that the LSD lingers in their body for months or years at a time. Um, some people I've read have even proposed that maybe what, are, what flashbacks are are just normal distortions in perception that all of us have from time to time. You kind of glance out the window and your vision blurs a little bit and maybe you just blink your eyes and everything goes back to normal. But if you've used LSD in the past, you might stop for a minute and think, oh, wow, am I having a flashback? The way that if you had never used LSD, you wouldn't pay much attention to the distortion. Again, it's hard to know. It's a difficult thing to study. Um, there do seem to be anecdotal accounts of people who have used LSD who experience flashbacks months or even years after their use. Um, it's not clear why this happens, if it does happen at all. And for some people, this may be uh, not particularly threatening. For other people, it might be quite unpleasant. So it's potentially something that can happen as a long-term or chronic effect of LSD use. Okay, so that's a, a fair bit of material for now. Um, I wanted to cut this lecture before it got too awful long. In the next lecture, I'm going to just talk about some more hallucinogens, including MDMA or ecstasy. Uh, but for now, that's about as far as I need to go. Uh, that's all for this lecture. And as I always say, thank you for your attention. Um, if you have some time to step away from the computer or the tablet or the phone and enjoy the outdoors or get a breath of fresh air, please do it. It's a beautiful day out there at least where I am. Hopefully it is where you are whenever you're watching this video. And again, thanks for your attention. When you're ready, I'll be back with another lecture about hallucinogens. So bye-bye.